This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. So this is the third in a series of videos where I challenge myself to replicate the look and lighting of another famous portrait photographer. And in the first one, we tried to replicate Yusuf Karsh's shot of Ernest Hemingway. And then last time, we tried to replicate Terry O'Neill's image of Michelle Pfeiffer. After those first two videos, there were a few of you in the comment section who suggested this third video. But before we get to it, I want to remind you that the reason I do these videos is because I used to follow a blog back in the day called Guess the Lighting, which was written by Ted Sabarizi, where he used to take famous portrait photographs or images that appeared in magazines, and he would try and reverse engineer and work out how were these images lit. And he create these sketched lighting diagrams with his answer to that question. I found reading that blog back then so helpful because it taught me to recognize the lighting that I was seeing in any given image and also taught me as I attempted to reverse engineer it, even just in my mind, how I might create that sort of lighting for myself. And I really think that it's one of the greatest skills a photographer can teach themselves to recognize and learn to recreate good light. When I thought about this video series, I didn't want to just try and work out how the lighting was done and just produce the lighting diagram. I wanted to push myself to see if I couldn't replicate the results of that photographer in the camera as well by producing an image at the end of the day that got as close as I possibly could to what they actually did. So with that, let's jump in. So as you probably guessed from the title and the thumbnail of this video, in this one, we're going to be trying to replicate the look of Martin Scholar's portrait, specifically his close and personal series that he does. And this is a look that he's produced with celebrities across the years in a lot of different contexts. It's a style that he's quite well known for. And it's one that a lot of you have been asking for when I started this series. Could I try and replicate his work? So in this one, we're going to try and see how close we can get to what he does. Now, the most important thing to take a look at with his portraits is the catch light in the eye. That's what makes these portraits. This kind of two vertical strips either side of the pupil that give this almost kind of cat's eye effect. And then the front of the face is lit and the sides of the face are darker so it gives a nice shape. I've seen people talking about these portraits and trying to work out how he does it, but I think they make a mistake when they read those catch lights. They look at it and say, well, there's a big gap in between those two lights, so they're obviously far apart, maybe 45 degrees angle either side. But what you have to remember is that you're looking at an eyeball reflecting light, and it's a curved surface, not a flat surface. So you might look at it and say, well, those lights look like they've got some distance between them, but actually I think they're very, very close together. And this is something I learned when I was shooting product photography. I used to shoot these big KitchenAid mixers with these kind of stainless steel bowls which would reflect the entire room. And I noticed when I was shooting those that I might be standing next to a light stand next to me, for example, but in the reflection in that bowl, it looked like it was further apart because the curvature on the bowl separates subjects out in the reflections more. So I actually think that when we look at these catch lights, these lights actually sit very close together and front on. They're not round to the sides at all. They're almost directly in front of the subject. So I think the first place to start is to say that we probably got uh, two strip boxes, one uh, either side of the subject. I think they're very close together. And I think the camera lens is literally just leaving enough room for the camera lens to kind of shoot between them, but they're really close to the subject. And I'll show you this kind of setup in the studio. I also think that these lights are gridded because I don't think he wants a lot of spill round to the side. He wants the light to be on the center of the face here and not to be bleeding round to the sides. So I think he's really looking for uh, to control that light. So I'm guessing there's some kind of grid with those strip boxes. And I'm also going to guess that these lights are constant lights because honestly, even if they're not, I'm going to be using constant lights because it would be horrible to have to sit in front of these lights being so close and directly in front of your face and flashing in your face bright all the time. So I'm going to use constant lights for this. I'm going to set them to daylight balance, make sure they're 5500 Kelvin down the middle and that they're nice and easy on the eyes and it's not going to strain too much. So I think this is going to give me that look. So if we look at it from overhead, I think it's going to be that uh, camera placed with the with the subject directly on, and I think we're going to have those two strip boxes very, very close to the camera lens, just wide enough apart to actually shoot down the middle without it actually getting in front of the shot itself. 
When it comes to the background of these portraits, I've noticed that over the years as he takes these portraits, the backgrounds change wildly. Sometimes they're light backgrounds, sometimes they're darker backgrounds, sometimes it's kind of a mid-gray, sometimes they're cooler in color tone, sometimes they're warmer. So I'm gonna give myself that same freedom today to try and find a background that I think will suit my subject and to not be too rigid or strict about it. I'm thinking I'll probably go for a slightly lighter background because he's more commonly shooting with a lighter background, but I'm not going to stick to that rigidly. In fact, maybe I'll even decide to do a couple of different options. But if you look, one of the common features of his background is that the bottom of the background is usually lighter than the top of the background. In fact, if I quickly just uh, color pick here, you can see this is the color of that bottom of the background. And if I color pick the top here, you can see that that is the color of the top. So there's quite a big difference, top to bottom. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm also gonna make sure that I'm gonna have a light behind my subject. So down the bottom, behind the subject down here, there will be a softbox of some sort or a little light panel, I'm thinking, that will throw light upwards onto the background so that it's lighting from the bottom up, giving sort of a similar look, that kind of light to dark, bottom to top. And because I'm gonna aim for a lighter background, I think what I'm gonna do is just pull my subject away and just use a white wall behind them and have that light at the bottom just to light it up a little bit from bottom to top, but not so much that it blows to white. I'm still gonna keep it sort of a light gray or at least start with that sort of style and see how I go. Then the other thing to notice on these portraits is that on the side, the cheeks and the sides of the head are pretty well sculpted. You can see that there's some nice shadow in there to kind of shape the face. So I think what's happening is, is that Scholl is using some kind of either black cloth or, or flags on the side of the subject to kind of suck some of that light out so that it doesn't bounce in. If there was anything white on the side, it would just come back in and fill these cheeks and the sides of the face. I think he's making sure that there's black flags, black muslin, uh, black velvet, something to just suck that light out and keep the shape on the face. In terms of focal length, he's obviously using a longer focal length and filling the frame with the subject's face. But you can see that it's a longer focal length because there is no distortion. If this was a wider angle, the face would really start to distort and the shape would change. I think he really wants it to stay natural and neutral looking, no, no stretching to that face. So for me, I'm probably going to use my 85mm uh, prime lens. It's a, a Sony 85mm 1.8. I'll show you in the studio. It's nothing super expensive, but I think it's really gonna get the job done for this style of portrait. And in terms of the aperture, I'm not totally sure yet, but it looks quite wide open. So I'll probably start at 1.8 or F2 or something and see if I can't get the same kind of look where you can see that this plane of the face, the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the chin, this is all definitely in focus. But by the time we get to the ears, and all this hair at the back, it's out of focus there as well. So what I'm gonna do is play with a few different aperture settings and see if I can get the similar kind of fall off where the whole of the front of the plane of the face is in focus and it just starts to drift out by the time we get to the ears. And I think that's enough for us to go into the studio and try this setup and see if we can get it dialed in. Okay, so I'm here in my little garage studio. I'm gonna show you the setup as I've got it. So if you look here, I've got my little mannequin head uh, just sitting there with those two strip lights right in front. Let me slide around the side just so you can see what I've done. So this is the mannequin head. From this side, I've got two gridded strip boxes with LED lights uh, facing my subject. It's very, very difficult to see at the moment if I've got the catch lights right because obviously the mannequin head doesn't really have uh, shiny eyeballs. So I'm gonna have to check that out when my subject sits in here. On the floor, on the back, I've just got a light panel that's lighting the background from bottom to top, like we said. So if we come around this side and sort of see from the angle of the camera, you can see that sort of uh, bottom to top, background's lighter at the bottom, darker at the top. I might dial it in, I might put some more light in, less light in, depending on what sort of gray I want. But to me, the sides of the face look well sculpted and the light down the middle looks pretty good. The camera here, is my Sony a7R4. If this little camera focuses, there we go. Uh, and you can see the settings on the camera there are one over 250th of a second. At f2, I think is about the right depth of field where the ears are falling off a little bit. 
but the front of the face, the whole plane of the front of the face, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, all in good focus. And I'm on ISO 200, and that looks uh, pretty good to me. The lens on the front is just the Sony 85mm 1.8. It's a really affordable lens actually for the amount of quality you get out of it, so it's a really good buy. And then the only other thing is that I've got these black flags on the side, like I said. So there's these pop-up uh, black backgrounds, which I'm basically creating a little booth. I've got one on this side as well, which I've just pulled away so I can get around to show you. But I'm going to pull that right in as well and just create like a little booth in there so you can't see. Let me pop this up properly. So my subject's really gonna sit inside this booth, black flag, right down the middle there. And you can see these two uh, modifiers are really, really close together. I've just got enough space to get that lens down the middle because I think that's what he's doing, getting the lights as far around the front as he possibly can. Then just to mention the LEDs I'm using, I didn't actually have two LEDs that took Bowen's mounts that were the same light. And it was important that they're exactly the same light because I don't want one brighter than the other, or one a different color temperature than the other. But I've just been sent these little Zion Molus 100s, where you can actually dial in the color temperature there. So you can see I've got it on 5500 Kelvin, which is daylight balance at 30%. And this other one is exactly the same. There we go. So we've got two lights, exactly the same LED lights. Um, they don't know I'm doing this. They have sent me these lights, but I said I wasn't going to do a review or anything. But if I did use them, I would mention them. Uh, and they're great. I wouldn't mention them if they weren't. These tiny little lights, you can see how small that is. I was looking for something that was going to be a good option to be able to travel with to shoot interviews. And it's miniature. The light itself is really just this little block here. And then you can have this adapter where you can put on a Bowens mount uh, on the front so you can use your soft boxes and everything. And it packs up in a little case that's really, really tiny. I mean, just so small. So having a little travel LED light like that is great for interviews, but obviously it saved my bacon in this case because I needed two lights that were exactly the same as each other, same color temperature, uh, same light on the back, same everything. Uh, so that's my setup and it's pretty simple. You can see at the moment there's kind of daylight flooding in. I'm just using that so you can actually see me. But when my subject actually gets here, I'm going to close these curtains or it could be later in the day. It's winter at the moment, so it's getting dark at about four o'clock. And uh, I want the room really dark. So this light isn't battling with that light at the front. I want the room dark and just focusing on that light over there. But I think this setup is going to be a good start for us uh, to get, I think, some fairly good results. So I only ended up taking about 15, maybe 20 shots in total because from the first minute the lighting was pretty much there. Uh, I think we got it right in the diagram and, and in the planning stage. So this is, I think, the better of the shots that I took. And this is the one that we'll quickly edit to final. And the point with this is there shouldn't be too much retouching. This is a gritty style of portraiture, so it should be a very, very quick edit. So let's turn on a reference image above. So I've got George Clooney sitting here. The first thing I want to do is just approximate a crop that will sort of work. So if I overlay him over the top and just put this to soft light or something so we get like a little onion skin effect. And then if I just control T, and just kind of line up the eyes a little bit, something, it doesn't have to be exact. Uh, all his crops seem to be slightly different, but something that's approximating uh, the same kind of composition and then just pull this crop in a little bit. Let me clear this ratio. He seems to, my camera shoots on a, on a three by two aspect ratio. Um, I think he's shooting on a four five or a six seven or something like that. I'm gonna leave a little bit more headroom than he does. Something like that looks pretty good. So let's turn George off. In fact, I'm gonna leave George here. We'll put him back to normal and then control T. I'm gonna leave him up in the corner just as a little reference to see how we're doing as we go. Pop him up here and we'll turn that off there. So like I said, there's no actual retouch. I'm not going to go around and try and, you know, smooth the skin out or anything like that. In fact, the point is to emphasize the texture in the skin with this sort of image. So the only thing I would do, my normal rule, is if there's something that's on the skin that won't be there in two weeks, 
I'll take it out. I'll give you a good skin day. But if it's your skin, I want to actually bring out more texture, which is usually the opposite of what a retoucher wants to do. You can see uh, with this image of George how much texture there is in the skin and how everything is left there because you want that grit. So a quick trick for bringing out some more texture in the skin is if I have this background layer selected, I come down to adjustment layers, I add black and white above and I dial my red channel and this will work for any skin tone, any skin type, dial it to the left because your shadows are always hiding in your reds with any skin tone. And you can see it's looking quite crazy, sort of that orthochromic look. And what I'm going to do then is change the blending mode of this uh, layer to soft light. Looks a bit too strong to me, so we're going to dial this down. Let me put my reference layer on above. And all I'm going to do is dial this up, uh, make sure my black and white layer is selected with my opacity at zero. I'm going to just start to dial it up until I'm getting a similar kind of uh, amount of nice shadow de detail and nice skin texture. Obviously Vlar has much better skin than George does. He's a younger man so you know I'm not going to go quite as far but something like 30, let's just leave it at 30% on here. That looks pretty good to me. Let's turn George off. Next thing I want to do is just a little dodge of those catch lights because it's the feature of the image. So when I dodge, which just means to paint in a bit of brightness on the image and this is a technique that goes back to the days of film my personal chosen technique is to do an adjustment layer and add a curves layer above. And I'm not going to change the actual curve, but I'm going to change the blending mode of the curve to screen. I'm moving fast with this. I've got whole videos on all these techniques in my retouching series. You can go check it out. I am going to make sure that my mask is selected. Control I to remove that effect, fill the mask with black. I'm going to take a brush, nice soft brush, 3% flow so I can paint this effect in slowly. And I'm going to just zoom right in on the eye. Now this is a good time to talk about this catch light because you can see the grid that I'm using in this catch light. Um, the, the soft boxes that I have, this is the grid that comes with them. It's this kind of fabric uh, sort of egg crate material which means that you can see the grid in the eye. I have a feeling Shirley is using something like a sort of more mesh-like grid which makes it more invisible in the eye. I tried to take off the grid and shoot without, but it just ended up killing the shadows because it just wrapped around the face and I wanted to keep the shape. So it was a bit of a compromise. I don't feel like it's a mistake. It's the only uh, softbox, with long softbox like this with a grid that I had available. So it's what I had to use. And it doesn't bug me that much. You have to really zoom in to see it. But this was something where I think it's it, it's slightly different to his. But again, it's you have to pixel peep to see it. So all I'm gonna do is with this effect, I'm going to paint in uh, I'm on black at the moment. Just watch this. If it's on black, you're not going to be doing anything. So X to flip it, and I'm just going to brush in that catch light. The thing with using mono blocks and strip blocks is you get a hot center, and it doesn't always extend all the way down the modifier. So I just want to make sure that I get all of that long catch light in and make that catch light really pop. I'm going to do the same to this other eye. Just painting down, dodging up those catch lights. There's lots of ways you can dodge. Uh, you use your technique if you want. This is just mine, a curves layer on screen. Now, if I zoom out and just fill the screen with these two eyes, if you see, if I turn this layer off and on, you can see what I've done. Just really pop those catch lights because for me, that's the feature. I'm going to do no editing the eyes. Vlachi has really cool eyes with this kind of light iris, which are a photographer's dream. So I don't really want to do more than that, but just make sure that those catch lights are the feature. And honestly, we're almost done now. I'm going to turn George on again on the top. And I might just add a levels layer. You can see the, the adjustment layers I'm adding are below George, so it's not affecting him, it's just affecting my, my shot of Vlar. I'm going to pop my highlights a little bit, which is just dragging my white point to the left. That's all I need to do. But if I hold down Alt as I drag, I can see where I'm going to start losing detail or burning the skin. So if I take it back to just before I start losing things, I don't mind my catch lights blowing a little bit. 243. And you can see I've done hardly anything to it, but I think we're pretty much there. I think that's really, really close now to what uh, what Shirl is actually doing with these images. Uh, a nice light, airy feel. You've got those really strong catch lights. One other thing I think I didn't do quite right is the angle of his shot seems to be almost facing directly into the nose, whereas I put the angle of my camera at Vlar's eyes. So what I think I should have done is just lower my camera ever so slightly on the tripod so that I feel like I'm looking up into his eyes slightly more than I am uh, where, it, where it feels very eye level in my image. So my angle I think is slightly off 
I did need to drop it a bit, but otherwise I think we're pretty close. That the feel of the image is right, the catch lights are great, the sides of the face are sculpted nicely, and I've left that kind of grit and that texture in the skin. I've even drawn it out. And I think if you put this image uh, in amongst a lot of his other images, I might get away with it. You know, it, it might be mistaken for one of his shots. I think we've got pretty close to what he does. But again, trying something like this, that's not at all the way that I normally shoot. I always learn something in the process. So I hope you found that helpful and you've learned some tips and techniques along the way. And maybe you want to try this lighting style out for yourself and see what sort of results you get. And just to say, this style of shooting and especially the lighting is not at all the way that I normally shoot portraits. It's quite far away in terms of the look. But I always find that trying something new that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, that's different to my normal style, I learn so much in the process. Feel free to jump down in the comments section and let me know if there are other photographers who have interesting portrait styles or lighting styles you'd like me to try. If I see something in there that's interesting that I want to give a go, it might be the next video. And I just want to say a special thank you to my friend Vla who sat as the model for this portrait. He is the friend who helps me to run the retreats that I put on in Tuscany every year. And we're running one again this year in 2024. It will be from the 29th of June to the 6th of July. Spaces are very limited. So if you are interested, I'll leave a link down below and you can go along and register your interest. And just to remind you to keep an eye out for the third volume of my Parable magazine, which will be out very soon. It might already be out by the time you're watching this video. This third edition is all about the church. I get asked a lot as an ex-pastor, why did you leave? How do you think about faith and spirituality today? So in this magazine, which is always a mix of writing and images all together to talk about a theme, I try and answer those questions for you. And lastly, thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. If you need a website or a domain, they're a fantastic option. I've used them myself as my website of choice for over 10 years now. One of the pieces of advice I was given a few years ago is how important it is to have a newsletter, which is something I hadn't paid much attention to before that, so that you can let that core following of yours know about events and about magazines you might be bringing out or books, because social media can be very, very fickle and doesn't necessarily reach even your own audience. For example, I have a bunch of events and talks and magazines and retreats coming out this year, and it's always that newsletter that hears about those things first. So if you'd like to get signed up, I'll leave a link down below. And I use Squarespace to put that newsletter together and to send it out. And it couldn't be simpler. I can just drag in text blocks and image blocks and keep the look of that newsletter really, really clean. And it matches my branding and the style of my website. And when people subscribe, they can go and put their email address into the little subscription block. They'll even get an email asking them to confirm, making sure they definitely want to subscribe. When I send that email out, I get a little report saying how many people it's arrived at, how many people have clicked and opened and actually read that information. And I find it's a great way to communicate with your core audience. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and go to squarespace.com forward slash Sean Tucker to get 10% off your first purchase.